Okie dokie artichokey, like I said in a previous video, I did pick up one of these 10th gen Core i5 10400 CPUs. This is actually the first and only one as, as far as I'm aware of the 10th gen CPUs that is not a case skew. So it's completely locked, can't be overclocked, but it is the cheapest of the four that I've seen compared to the uh, unlocked Core i5, i7, and i9. This is only $186 at the time of filming on Amazon, which positions it directly against that. Not, not, not that whole setup, but the, the Ryzen 5 3600, which is underneath that AIO pump, uh, is also around that price. I think it's selling for around $172, $173 on Amazon at the time of filming. So these two CPUs are pretty much square in terms of pricing. We'll actually see today how this guy performs when it comes to gaming. Sorry, my foot's in there. I, I should have worn socks today. And we'll see how it performs when it comes to gaming and compute workloads. Uh, single threaded performance will be tested, temperatures, power draw, all that jazz. Apart from pricing though, the other thing that makes this sub $200 CPU matchup so interesting to me is that we now have hyper threading on almost the full stack of 10th gen CPUs. So this Core i5 actually has six cores and 12 threads, whereas its predecessor, the Core i5 9400, only had six cores and six threads, which meant it fell way behind the 3600 when it came to workstation applications. But this CPU may not have to suffer the same fate. As far as boost clock frequencies go, the Intel chip has a slight leg up, boosting to 4.3 gigahertz out of the box versus 4.2 gigahertz on the Ryzen 5 3600, but the 3600 can be overclocked, whereas you've already hit a ceiling here as soon as you take it out of the box. Assuming you have adequate cooling and the basic know-how, you can easily take the 3600 beyond uh, these stock frequencies. The other thing that I'll mention though, is that since this is a locked chip, you don't have to buy a Z490 motherboard, which tend to be uh, a bit more expensive than Intel's cheaper 400 series board like their upcoming B460 boards. This definitely makes the upfront costs of a 10400 a lot more competitive with something like the Ryzen 5 3600 compared to the other unlocked 10th gen CPUs we've seen so far. This chip also includes a stock cooler. It's Intel's basic stock cooler that none of us really like, but it's there. It's one less thing you have to buy, which uh, again is a bit more in line with how AMD is doing things. TDP is 65 watts for both chips, so they're effectively identical, at least on paper. Intel kind of gets a bad rap for uh, basing their TDPs off of their chip's base clock as opposed to their boot frequencies, which uh, can sometimes surprise people when they find out, wow, this thing draws a lot of power and makes a lot of heat, but we'll actually see how this chip does uh, on the test bed. As far as testing methodology goes, I'll be using an open air test bench today. And by open air test bench, I mean this motherboard box. Now, as I mentioned, a fitting motherboard for this chip would be something like a B460 board, but those have not arrived yet. They're supposed to be coming out, I think in mid June, right around the time AMD's B550 boards launch, coincidence. So because of that, we don't have a B460 board to test on, which means I'll be using this I don't know, $800 motherboard. I have no idea how much this costs, probably more than my house, but this is the MSI Meg Z490 Godlike. It's absolutely insane and should not ever be used with a chip like this. And rest assured, all of the power limits and other boosting algorithms that MSI has maybe baked into their own UEFI on this board are going to be useless on this chip because it's completely locked. So uh, we are gonna be running this chip, of course, at stock values as we are with the 3600. On the AMD side, we've got the MSI, what is this, Z, no, X570 MPG Gaming Pro Carbon Wi-Fi. I'm pretty sure those are all the right words, but I'm not sure if that's the right order. At any rate, it's an X570 motherboard. And I think apart from storage, that's where the differences in both of our test beds end because we're using the same cooler, memory, GPU and power supply for both systems. And the cooler is the Fractal Design Celsius Plus. This is the 280 millimeter AIO, so thermal limitations won't be an issue for today's testing. For memory, we've got a two by eight gig kit of G-Skills Trident Z Royal RGB DDR4 at 4,000 speed. However, the XMP profile for that speed just wasn't stable on this particular board. So I decided to nub it down to 3600, which is still respectable speeds for both of these platforms. So 3600 is what its operating frequency is. And then we've got an RTX 27 Super Founders Edition from NVIDIA. The reason I picked this GPU is because I took a poll on Twitter and asked you guys what GPU you would realistically pair with the Ryzen 5 3600. And actually the GPU that came out on top was the RTX 2060 Super, but the 2070 Super was very close. It wasn't far behind at all. I still picked this card to test with today because I feel like the number one component that people, that gamers will upgrade down the line is the graphics card. So I feel like testing with this GPU will shine a longer light on how capable these CPUs will be, not just today, but 
potentially years down the line when users decide to upgrade their graphics card. Last but not least, our power supply is the NZXT C750, which is plenty of power for both of our systems today. Now, I kind of phrased this video earlier as if I hadn't done all my testing already, but I totally have. I lied. I'm a complete con artist and you shouldn't believe anything I say. But let's talk about frequencies first. So when I monitor frequency behavior with our CPUs, I take a look at how they behave in Cinebench R20, both the single-threaded and the multi-threaded tests, as well as how they behave in Adobe Premiere Pro slash media encoder while transcoding a video. And what I noticed with the Ryzen 5 3600 is that it all core turbos to around four, between four and 4.1 gigahertz. It's always within that range. It kind of fluctuates. With the single-threaded performance in Cinebench R20, um, we saw one or two of the cores boosting to 4.2 gigahertz at any given time, which is the advertised spec on the box. As for the 10400 here, it turboed on all cores in both tests to four gigahertz, flat. Four gigahertz across the board, it never really strayed away from that. Unfortunately, it stayed at four gigahertz, even on our single threaded Cinebench R20 test, which kind of surprised me. I was expecting to see it pop up to 4.3 gigahertz, at least on one of the cores at some point. That's not to say this chip never boosted beyond four gigahertz during all of my testing. It's just that during the testing where I was monitoring the frequencies, I never saw it go past four gigahertz on any of the cores. Now, as far as thermals are concerned, I ran my temperature tests in Adobe Premiere Pro while we were rendering a video in uh, Adobe Media Encoder, and these are the results we found. With the Ryzen 5 3600, it averaged 73.3 degrees Celsius, with a max temp hitting 75.5, whereas our Core i5 10400 averaged at 54 degrees C and peaked at just 58 degrees Celsius. So definitely the cooler running chip here goes to Intel. And I think we've already partially answered exactly why that is. It's due to the, the somewhat lackluster turbo frequencies that this thing saying uh, in this particular test. Four gigahertz is actually kind of slow when you compare this to something like the Core i5-10600K, which can easily hit five gigahertz on all cores. I guess the silver lining here is that this chip doesn't run very hot because of it, so you probably don't need as beefy of a cooler as you do with the much warmer running 3600. Albeit, when we take a look at the actual media encoder scores, you can then determine for yourself if you think the cooler temps on the Intel chip is worth it. The script kind of gets flipped when we take a look at power draw. So for power draw, I actually monitor everything from the wall. Uh, you know, the system's plugged into a kilowatt while I run a blender test, specifically the BMW 27 benchmark, um, or project I should say, and these are the numbers that I got. These are the peak values in watts of what each of these systems was drawing. This is full system uh, power draw with the Ryzen 5 3600 system pulling 150 watts at max and the Core i5 10400 pulling a whopping 350 watts from the wall. More than double the power draw than the 3600. That's insane. So while the 10400 definitely is the cooler running chip, it's also the much more power hungry one. And I think part of that is due to the fact that we're still on a 14 nanometer process that's just not quite as power efficient as it used to be. Certainly not as power efficient as AMD's Zen 2 7 nanometer arc. This definitely goes to show that there are certain areas that Intel is just no longer able to improve on this particular process. They're gonna need to hop down to either 10 or seven nanometers soon if they wanna keep their 65 watt TDP chips from consuming as much power as a nuclear reactor. At this point, I think we're ready to kick it off to some benchmarks. We're gonna be taking a look at gaming performance. I tested five different titles at 1920 by 1080 and 2560 by 1440. And then also I ran some compute benchmarks so we can see how the chips stack up when it comes to things like productivity tasks. This time around, I'm gonna skip the real-time commentary and just let you guys enjoy the slides with some music, absorb it, take it all in, and then we'll circle back afterwards, talk about it, and decide once and for all which of these offerings is the ultimate sub $200 CPU. Roll the benchmarks.
Okay, Papa Kyle, what does all the data mean? Well, I will tell you, my children. So for starters, it seems like the Core i5-10400 is the faster gaming chip compared to the Ryzen 5 3600. Not a huge surprise there. Like I said, I didn't monitor the actual frequencies while we were gaming, so I can't be sure if it was still capped at four gigahertz or if the 10400 ever got beyond that uh, to its advertised 4.3 gigahertz boost. But whatever the case, it is a faster gaming CPU at the end of the day. At 1080p, it sort of bounces between single digit and low double digit gains. Uh, there are some instances like in Far Cry 5 where it really pulls far ahead of the 3600, but those instances seem to be few and far between. Once we put more pressure on the GPU at 1440p, however, the 10400's lead over the 3600 is typically too small to make a noticeable difference. Now, even with the same core and thread count, the Ryzen 3600 still manages to have the upper hand when it comes to productivity workloads. Although this time around, it seems like its leads are a bit more inconsistent than they've traditionally been. For example, the 3600 absolutely destroys the Intel chip when it comes to Adobe Premiere Pro and Handbrake, but its leads elsewhere are pretty marginal, meaning that the Core i5 could be enjoying some of that new hyper-threading support. Still, I feel like the 10400 would be a lot more competitive if it was unlocked. If users could get in there and manually tweak or overclock their CPUs, it could definitely close up some of the performance gap and stay a bit more competitive with the 3600. Uh, of course, for that to happen, you would also need to make a B460 support overclocking so that people wouldn't have to spend an arm and a leg for that privilege. So Intel does still have a long way to go. I mean, cheers to them for adding hyper-threading to nearly the full stack of 10th gen, but uh, things like you know unlocked chips across the board and having a viable overclocking platform that's more economical is uh, still something they need to hop on the bandwagon with. Without a doubt, that four gigahertz cap that we kept hitting on the 10400 is crippling, and it's a bit frustrating when we know that it's capable of much more. As usual, the Ryzen 5 3600 is the better all-rounder. It's still a great gaming CPU, and it absolutely crushes uh, productivity tasks like video editing and transcoding. That being said, the 10500 or 10400 is still a very viable choice if gaming is your main squeeze, especially if you're gaming at 1080p, uh, and that's pretty much all you're gonna be doing, or you just don't care too much about productivity uh, performance. What I like most about it is that it offers higher frame rates than its direct AMD competitor without having a premium price attached to it like some of the other case queues. What I don't like about it is that it's not overclockable and it consumes a lot of power for a sub $200 CPU. Then there's also the platform considerations like if you happen to buy a B460 board for this chip, um, you know, what's the longevity of that platform going to be? Is Intel going to be, you know, uh, supporting future generation CPUs on B460 for, for more than a year or two? Um, whereas I think on B550 with AMD, that's also coming up in June, um, we can probably expect a bit more forwards compatibility just because we've now seen them support a particular platform for up to three CPU generations, which is something Intel has not done in recent history. The last seed I'll plant in your head is that the 10400 might make a good CPU for something like a home theater PC or a system that doesn't have a discrete graphics card paired with it. Uh, of course, I'd love to see a matchup between that and the Ryzen 3400G, which is an APU that has Vega graphics on board, um, but it's a little bit cheaper. The Ryzen chip's a bit cheaper, but the 10400 has more cores and threads, so I think that'd be an interesting matchup. Uh, you guys let me know if you'd like to see something like that in the near future. But I'm going to get out of here. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. Toss a like on it before you go. It helps a lot. And check out our merchandise store, bitwit.tech. We have a fresh new look and it's been all refined and stuff by our awesome designer, Richard. He did a great job. It looks really nice. And there's also plenty of nice merchandise on there for you to buy, wear, drink out of, and a multitude of other verbs that you're sure to enjoy. It's a great way to give back to the channel and support what we do here if you like our content. Thanks again, guys. Have a good one and I'll see y'all in the next video.